This is the gate of Old Cairo, opening to the south and west, the Bab el Thuela, a superb structure built 900 years ago. Through its majestic portals, century after century, came traders and travelers, generals, even kings from West Africa, North Africa, from Muslim Spain, and sometimes from the countries of Christian Europe. The whole international system of trade of those days, reaching as it did from the Atlantic to the Sea of China, had its heart and center here in Old Cairo. city of Islam since the 7th century, Cairo entered a long period of prosperity and power when the sultans of northwest Africa, known as the Fatimid dynasty, moved east from Tunis and established here a new capital. Under the Fatimid sultans, Cairo became a remarkably rich and tolerant city, renowned for its spending on art and scholarship and dominating the commerce of half the world. Ibn Khaldun, a great North African historian, has left us a description of the city he knew as it was at the end of the 14th century. Cairo is the metropolis of the universe, the garden of the world, the gateway of Islam, the throne of kings. A city of castles and palaces, lit by the moons and stars of erudition. structure of learning and devotion was underpinned and its credit upheld by a monetary standard of coins minted in African gold. For years the most important coin remained the Almoravid or Berber dinar of northwest Africa. Then Europe emerging from its poverty in the dark ages became at last able to pay for the import of African gold. Florence minted the first European gold coins since Roman times. Other cities followed, and new gold currencies appeared in Spain and the Netherlands, France and Portugal. A new era in commercial development had begun, laying foundations for Europe's supremacy in trade and industry. The new monetary standard moved north as far as England, where a series of gold coins were to culminate in the famous Golden Guinea of Charles II minted, like all the others, in gold from West Africa, symbolized by an elephant. Europe depended on Africa for its monetary stability in a trading partnership, which we can see reflected in the grand flowering of Renaissance culture. However different they might be in their history and appearance, black people are depicted in these great works of art as the natural equals of white people. This had been the attitude of the Greeks and Romans, and still for a time at least, it remained the attitude of Europe. In that ever surprising new dawn of the Renaissance, the essential unity of mankind was not in question. <laughs> 